welcome to this new life. I'm excited about you watching and today we are going to continue from last week. Now the subject last week was that a question that Jesus did ask his disciples. Who do you say I am? And this is actually a question he's asking every single one of us. This question is also asked to you today. Who do you say I am? And uh, we are going to continue this subject from last week. The message, the title of this message is actually a question. A question that I think every person on this planet should ask themselves. It's a question that Jesus did ask to his disciples. And we're going to read it from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13 to 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who do you say I am? Who do you say Jesus is? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Who is Jesus? When I say Jesus Christ to you, what do you then have in mind? What thoughts is coming to you? Maybe for, for some of you it's just a swearing word that you use every now and then. Maybe for others it's like, okay, uh, he was a good person that lived, a historic person that lived, and he was doing really good to the poor. He was a spokesman for the, the helpless. And that's your perception of who Jesus was, that he was a good person. Or maybe you say like this, that, oh yeah, he was some kind of a political leader living in the Middle East, trying to make a revolution, and yes, it was a peaceful revolution without weapon or anything in order to, to give uh, people a better living or maybe a, a more loving um, living together and so on. And he was teaching really great laws and principles and so. Maybe for you, he's just a political leader, political person. Or maybe you see himself as, oh, he was like a spiritual leader. Oh, he was like a guru. Someone that came and gave direct, divine direction to us. One who, who was showing a higher level of moral standards and so. So that he was, yes, a, a, a spiritual guidance, a spiritual leader to many. And, and you even agree with many of the principles that Jesus, he taught. Or maybe you say that, oh, he was a prophet. Definitely, he was a prophet. Somebody that God sent to speak to mankind on God's behalf. But you see, when Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Then Peter answered a very interesting uh, answer. That is none of those examples I just gave. Because Peter said, and remember, he's a first-hand witness, okay? Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the one sent from God. When he said, you are the Christ, he really meant that you are the one we have been waiting for, the Savior that the Word of God has been promising that should come someday. And Jesus encouraged him that this was the right answer. He was just interested in hearing how did Peter and his disciples really find it. The Bible says how Jesus was more than a man. He was more than a good person, more than a political leader. He was more than a spokesman or more than a prophet. Let's just dig into a few scriptures that the Bible says and explains who Jesus truly was and, by the way, still is. Colossians 1 verse 15, it says that he, and that is Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In other terms, 
What is written here is that Jesus Christ was not just one that was sent from God, a one that um, was uh, anointed by God, but that Jesus was the, the image of the invisible God. Another word says in, in John chapter 1, verse 1, where the, the writer of the Gospel of John, he starts out listen, in, a, in a very uh, direct way. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. From the beginning of the universe, from the beginning of everything, was the Word. Now, it's obviously, as you continue to read, that it is Jesus he's referring to, Jesus being the Word. It was not a word, it was the Word. It was not a word with a, with a small uh, W, it was a capital W word. It was, he was referring to like somebody. Not a sentence, but some person. And this person was Jesus Christ. And then it says, it was with the word was with God. And then he continues in the next century. It actually was God. So the Bible says how, how Jesus, he was God. In the Gospel of John chapter 10, it says like this. This is Jesus saying this. I and my Father are one. Some People ask and say, oh, no, no, Jesus was not God. He might be, be close to him and so, but, but he was not God. But when Jesus said, I and my Father, referring to God, we are one, it's like one piece, like this is one thumb. This is not a thumb and then there's a pointing finger next to it. It is one. We are one, he said about himself. And let's have one more scripture and then I'm going to show you an illustration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6, it says like this, For us there is one God. As followers of Jesus, we only believe there is one God. Father, the Father of whom all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So what the Bible teaches is that God of course is God, but Jesus is also God, and it is one God. Let me explain how this is possible in this illustration. In this illustration, I have two things. We have steam as it is here, all right? Actually, this steam is water. It just has this vapor um, contents, uh, that, but it's on the bottom line, it is water. And then we have ice. This seems to be just the opposite of steam. But you know, when this ice is melting, it turns into water. And often you think like, okay, but God is like this and that, and Jesus is like that, so they cannot be one and the same thing. Wrong. You see, in this illustration, it was exactly how it is. Yeah, God has his way of expressing or showing and then Jesus being God coming to us. You might think, oh, but it's so much different. But on the bottom line, it's water. One and the same thing. So God is God and Jesus is God. Not two gods, but one and the same thing. Now, Jesus is one. And there's three reasons that we want to focus in. Why was then Jesus coming to this earth. Well, there's three things, and let me just sum up from last week. You see, last week we realized that Jesus was coming for us to know how God truly is like. Like, you know, I, if I said to you, I have a timer under this, and then you should start to guess how does this timer look like? Is it a digital one? Is it something that is connected to internet or what is it? And because it's just guessing, you have an idea. It might be like this or that. Maybe it's a clock or it's a watch or what is it? And uh, we all sometimes can have our idea of how is God truly like? 
That's why one of the things that Jesus coming was to, for us to fully understand and have a clear idea of how God truly is. So Jesus came in order to take away the veil and for us to see more specific. This is a timer. And uh, now you have immediately an idea, okay, so this is how it works, and you have a clear idea. There might still be questions for you, um, but uh, you have a much better idea. This is the same with Jesus coming to us. He came for us that we should have an understanding how God is like. Not how he looks like physically, but how he is. And there were three things we were talking about. He wanted to make known to us that God is love. And number two, he wanted for us to know how God is in the business of restoring our lives, spirit, body, and soul. And number three, he came for us that he should uh, deliver us from the works of the devil. And you know, the devil wants to tear our life apart. The devil wants us to, wants bad to off all the evil bad things happening in this life is basically because either fallen mankind that we can be evil and that the devil is evil. God is good. And Jesus was sent in order for us to understand that God truly is good. And he wants us to have that life that he had created us to have. Now, as long as we live on this earth, we will always be struggling with the consequences uh, on this earth, the consequences of evil, the consequences of sin, the consequences of all these things that has happened in the world. It's not like we are taken out of this world, but in the midst of all of this, God is with us, helping, protecting. This is not like just, you know, that we are taking the elevator and we don't have to do anything ourselves. Now it's more like he prepares steps for us to take one by one until we reach up to where he has something awaiting. There's two more things that Jesus had come to do to us, that the reason that God came to us was. And the next one is that he came in order to sacrifice himself as a ransom for you and for me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, we read this. He, that's Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into his kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This was a major reason that Jesus, he came. Jesus was actually prepared to be this sacrifice even from before the creation of the world. We read, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it says that He, that's God, chose us in Him, that's Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Before the, even the foundation of the world, Jesus was already meant to give his life as a sacrifice for you and for me. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9b, we read this. According to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. It was given to us before Jesus, in, in Christ Jesus, even before time began. You see, when Jesus was being crucified, it was not a coincidence. It was not something that happened uh, uh, out of a choice of men or, or a decision really made by the Roman soldiers. It was a decision that was a plan that was made even before the uh, creation of the universe and in, before the time began, that Jesus was going to be this perfect sacrifice that you and I can get life, eternal life in him. The idea of sacrifices has been from the very beginning of the world. When we read in Genesis, we read how God created everything, also Adam and Eve. But what happened was that Adam and Eve, they failed. They started to commit sin. And then it's very interesting that the first thing God is doing as an act, 
after he saw the sin of Adam and Eve was to provide for them skin so that they could dress themselves in this and not be naked. Now, where did this skin come from? It came from animals that have been slaughtered. It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God already there started the idea of a sacrifice had to be made for mankind. We read it again in, uh, about Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Here, Abraham was about to bring um, an illustrative sacrifice. And um, uh, Isaac was asking, but who is going to be sacrificed? And then uh, Abraham said, oh, God will find the real sacrifice, referring to that lamb. Later on, we read about the exodus of um, the Israelites as they were to exit Egypt in, in uh, Exodus chapter 12. Uh, God instructed them to slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the uh, doorpost and then they would be safe, even from death. It was again an illustration that God was preparing and later on we read all through the Old Testament how the idea and illustrations of sacrifices was to, in order to point toward the unique once for all sacrifice that Jesus was coming to do. This means that after Jesus was crucified on the cross, the, the thought of sacrificing uh, animals in order to get saved stopped because now the unique sacrifice of Jesus has been taken. It reads something really powerful in Hebrew chapter 7, verse 27, about the sacrifice of Jesus. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for his people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. This is Jesus they're talking about. That he once for all, once for you, once for me, forever sacrificed himself in order for us to get eternal life. This is incredible what Jesus did on that cross for you and for me. Do you know that without Jesus we are all so lost? We might be doing great here in life, have more than plenty, enjoying life. Maybe you are a super rich person, or maybe you are poor and you are having a difficult time. And uh, no matter where on the scale of these two or maybe in between that you find yourself, then there's one thing we all have in common. No matter what nation you live in, no matter of your walks of life or your background, your race, your culture, no matter what, we have all this one thing in common, that we are sinners. That our sins, all the things that we did that we should not do, they're all the things that God would never have done, but we all have done. I'm pretty sure that you all know that this and admit this, that we are sinners. If you for a moment just to, should be honest to yourself, if I ask this question, are you a sinner? I'm pretty sure you would admit, yeah, I am. And maybe you even start to argue, but I'm not the worst, but I'm not this, but I'm not that. But to be honest, we do all know that we are sinners. Jesus came to save us, that we was disqualified for eternal life, but he came to qualifies us to eternal life. As we read here, he came, he gave his life on the cross in order that his blood should be shed for that blood to cleanse all our sins away. And when we receive Jesus as our Savior, his blood will cleanse our lives from our sins. That's why we need Jesus. The third reason was that Jesus came in order for us to have eternal life. 
That's actually the next step or the consequence after having Jesus cleanse you from all your sins is that the result is that he will give you eternal life. He'll be with you eternally. This means that this very moment that you ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your savior, something happens. It's like there's going to start to be a flow of life from God into you. Jesus said like this in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What an invitation. Jesus said, come to me, and there's going to be a river of life that's going to be in, inside of you. Maybe you feel that there's no life inside of you. Maybe you all the time feel you need to fill in something else, entertainment, material things, money, sex. Maybe you are, you are you're all the time on the run for better things or better hope. But you know, it's like, it's like a an, an never-ending thing. You think that the next thing, the more of this or that, is going to satisfy yourself. But that's not going to happen. There's only one that said he can bring you this everlasting living water that is going to satisfy you, that's going to continue. You. And that is when Jesus saves you and his life starts to flow to you. That's for here and now. I've seen it so many times. I've heard it so many times. People said, I got peace in my heart. I got something new. I got, you know, life like back in my heart when I had Jesus. That's why Jesus came. And also it stretches beyond, beyond death. This means it's even going to affect your eternity. Jesus said in John 3, 16, that he came to give us life eternally. That we should have eternal life. That we should not perish, but have eternal life. That's why Jesus came, because he wants you to spend eternity in heaven. And if you say, man, that's what I want and that is what I need, then you better pray together with me this prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart and to save you. Save you from your sins, that he'll forgive them. Save your soul. Jesus is inviting you to do this. And do you know, it's just one prayer away from you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer where we are asking Jesus to come into our heart. And if you want to be included in this prayer, then put your hand upon your heart right now. Close your eyes and just pray this same prayer in your own language. That's I am praying it. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, I believe. You're the Son of God. Save me, Jesus. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart with your living water. Give me your eternal life. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I will follow you. I will worship you every day the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. When you prayed this prayer, Jesus did hear that prayer from his heart. And now it's just important that every day from now on that you keep yourself close to Jesus every day. Let me share with you three things you can do that will help you to stay close to Jesus. Number one. Pray to Jesus every day. Just like we prayed right here now, you can pray directly to Jesus. You can pray to Jesus at any time of the day, at any position, and at any place. You don't have to be in a certain building. You don't have to be in a certain position. 
but pray to Jesus every day. Number two, when we read in the, in the Bible, which is the word of God, we learn more about Jesus, just like we have done in this program. And in that way, you already now started to understand new things about Jesus. That's why it's important that we on a regular basis that we read in the Bible. Maybe you say, but I don't have a Bible. But then maybe you know of somebody who has a Bible. Why don't you ask that person if you can read in the Bible together? Or maybe you have a smartphone. Do you know that you can download the entire Bible in your own language on your phone and it's all for free? And in that way, you can start to read in the Bible on a regular basis. You can start reading in the Gospel of John, as we also have been quoting from today, or maybe in the Gospel of Luke. That's two great places to start. The third thing that will help you to stay close to Jesus is this. You need to have fellowship with others who's also following and believing in Jesus as their Savior. Maybe you know of such a fellowship in your neighborhood. Why don't you ask if you could be part of that fellowship? Or maybe you know of somebody that you know is also a follower of Jesus. Why don't you ask that person if you could sit down and maybe have a cup of tea or have a cup of coffee and talk together and in that way talk about Jesus and what this means to you. It is strengthening you a lot. If you say, but I don't know any fellowship and I don't know even one single person who is following Jesus. Then you know you can always have fellowship with uh, other believers through these programs on this channel. Also, there's this call center. You will see the information on the screen, how to get in touch with our call center. There's people sitting there waiting for you to respond. If you prayed this prayer, please respond to our call center, either through social media, through email or phone, in one way or another. And there's people there that will pray for you, that will help answering questions, and uh, that will give you guidance. So why don't you contact them in order in that way to have start to have contact with others who's also following Jesus. You have been watching this new life. And if you prayed this prayer today, you have received this new life that God has to us given through Jesus Christ. I will invite you to watch our program against, again next week. Until then, God bless you and be with you.